In this video, we're going to derive the particle on the ring wave function. So in the previous video, we introduced the particle on the ring problem, right? It's a particle on a two dimensional ring. And we talked about how we would model this quantum mechanically. And we saw that we would have some particle of mass M that's confined to a ring where there's no potential acting on the particle in the ring. But if it were to deviate on any other side of the ring, it, it can't because it's confined by an infinite potential on both sides of the ring, right? So uh, basically you have a potential function that functions in the following way. So you've got the potential function. So the potential is going to be a function of the radius, right? And it's basically going to function in the following way, right? This particle is a distance capital R away from the center of the ring. And so basically this potential is going to be zero if the radius is equal to that distance capital R and it's going to be infinite literally anywhere else, right? So if it's less than or greater than that distance R, then you're going to end up with an infinite potential, right? So it's basically going to effectively function like that, similar to the potential for the particle in a box. Uh, the only thing that we have to consider here is that this particle can move in two directions, right? It's, it's moving in the X direction and the y direction or i should say you know it's, it's moving along the ring but it has linear momentum in the x and the y direction so when we're thinking about that from the context of building a hamiltonian right we're going to be using a two-dimensional hamiltonian in order to model this problem right so our two-dimensional hamiltonian we're going to have that kinetic energy contribution h bar squared over 2m second derivative with respect to x plus the second derivative with respect to y right so uh so this is our laplacian right the sum of these two derivatives uh the second derivative of with respect to x and the second derivative with respect to y now the only thing here is we have a particle that's moving in a circle, right? We're dealing with circular motion. And so it's going to be advantageous for us to be in spherical polar coordinates rather than Cartesian coordinates, right? But since we're, we're dealing with the radius as the position and uh, we're dealing with different angles, so it's going to be much easier for us and more natural for us to discuss this problem in spherical polar coordinates rather than the typical Cartesians. So we're going to want to convert the Laplacian to spherical polar coordinates, right? And again, the, the Laplacian is just these two derivatives here. So we got these derivatives are second derivative with respect to X plus second derivative with respect to Y. And so in spherical polar coordinates, when you transform this Laplacian, you get the following result. You get second derivative with respect to R plus one over R ddr plus one over r squared second derivative with respect to phi right phi is the azimuthal angle remember in a spherical polar coordinates you got the radius polar angle and azimuthal angle phi is going to be your azimuthal angle now this may look like a beast and it is but uh but we actually get a little bit of simplification because of the confines of our problem so uh so in spherical polar coordinates here right a lot of this depends on the change in the radius however because of the way that we've defined this problem for the particle on the ring our radius isn't changing here right so we don't have any change in r it has to be equal to this same constant radius so that means that this derivative is going to be zero right since there's no change in r there's no second derivative with respect to r there's also no first derivative right so both of those terms actually uh fall out here those go to zero and so we actually end up with a greatly simplified hamiltonian so let me put it here right so our hamiltonian actually simplifies to the following form well, we have negative h bar squared over 2m r squared second derivative of phi right so that ends up being our very simplified hamiltonian in spherical polar coordinates because of the way that we've defined this problem for the particle on the ring all of these terms that depended on a change in r are just going to fall out right okay so given that we can build a time independent schrodinger equation 
So our TISE, time independent Schrodinger equation, is going to look like the following, right? So we're going to have h bar squared over 2m r squared. Second derivative of the wave function with respect to phi. It's going to be equal to e psi. Right, so you can bring the energy over to get the following, right? So you got negative h bar squared over 2m r squared d squared psi, second derivative with respect to phi, uh, plus or minus e psi is equal to zero, right? And you can basically uh, make both of these terms positive since we have zero on the other side. So we'll go ahead and do that um, and uh, do a little bit of algebra here. So let's do second derivative respect of psi with respect to phi plus 2mr squared e over h bar squared. That should be times psi as well. equals zero, right? So um, so the reason that I'm doing this um, is because we're going to define a new quantity. So this quantity is called the natural frequency. Natural frequency omega. And this natural frequency is defined in the following way, where you have a square root of 2mr squared times e over h bar squared. Right, so that's the definition of our natural frequency. And so this allows us to simplify our, our uh, Schrodinger equation a little bit. So if we plug that back in, then we get the second derivative of our wave function with respect to phi, omega squared psi, equals zero, right? So um, so now having rewritten this in this form, we actually have very simple uh, a very simple solution to this type of differential equation. And we've actually seen it before. So the function that can solve this differential equation is where we have some constant and we have an exponential, right? So we'll have I omega phi. Right, so this function actually solves this differential equation, right? So now the only thing that we have to do uh, in order to get the actual wave function for the particle on the ring is one, consider the boundary conditions, and two, get the uh, normalization constant. So let's do the boundary conditions first, and let's go to a new slide. Right, so for a particle on the ring, the boundary conditions that it has to satisfy are called cyclic boundary conditions. So it has to satisfy cyclic boundary conditions. So what this means is, you know, just like in any other, um, just like when you think about your unit circle, right? Zero has to be equal to two pi, equal to four pi, equal to six pi, right? Every revolution of the circle has to be equal. And so cyclic boundary conditions means that the wave function at zero degrees has to be equal to the wave function at 360 degrees, right? Which has to be equal to the wave function at 720 degrees, so on and so forth, right? Each pass through the circle, it has to be equal at each point. Or if we wanna say this more generally, then we can say that psi of phi uh, has to be equal to psi of phi plus two pi. Right, so if you add on another revolution to that circle, that has to be equal to the same spot that it previously was in, right? So uh, given that it has to satisfy these cyclic boundary conditions, then that means that implies the following. So it implies the following, right? So if we have our exponential function, right? We know we got I omega phi must be equal to e to the i omega 
times phi plus two pi, right? These have to be equal in order for this to be valid. So, um, so what we'll do here is to uh, use some uh, properties of the exponential in order to simplify this expression. So we got e to the i omega phi on the left hand side. And then anytime you have some a sum in the exponential, you can turn that into a product in the following way where you have e to the i omega phi times e to the i omega two pi. Right. So basically just using a property of the exponential in order to expand that guy. And what we get here is some cancellation. Right. So algebraically, this guy cancels with this guy. So we end up with e to the i omega two pi must be equal to one. Right. So now we have a constraint on on omega, on our angular frequency. Right. So this statement is true, right? Well, actually, let's uh, let's expand it using Euler's relationship so we can see when this is going to be true. So expand using the Euler relationship. So if we use the Euler relationship, then we got cosine omega two pi plus I sine omega two pi, right? That's gonna be equal to one, right? All I did was just expand this exponential using Euler's relationship. And so if we do, if we have this, right, our this statement is gonna be true as long as omega is plus or minus some whole number integer, right? Either zero or plus or minus some whole number integer, because if it is, then that means that sine zero is going to, or sine of two pi, sine of four pi, whatever, is going to be zero. And then cosine of this number would be one, and that would give us one. So that statement is true if omega is equal to plus or minus some integer, right? Zero or some integer. So that gives us the following form for the wave function where we got psi of phi is going to be equal to C1 e to the i n phi, right? Where n in this case is going to be any integer, right? Makes this statement true. Okay, so we have our form of our wave function that, that satisfies the, the differential equation and that gives us um, a form that fits our physical problem via the boundary conditions. Last thing we gotta do is normalize, and this is pretty easy. So we're gonna normalize this wave function. So again, to normalize this guy, we're gonna integrate over all space for the azimuthal angle, that's zero to two pi. And we're gonna have the complex conjugate there, times psi phi, d phi should equal to one, right? So now our uh, normalization constant comes on the outside. So that's C1 squared. And then we're going from zero to two pi of e to the negative i n phi, right? Since we're doing the complex conjugate here, that's gonna be a negative and e to the i n phi, d phi is equal to one. Right. So now um, when you multiply these together, you just end up with one. So this just turns into a really simple integral. So you got zero to two pi of D phi equals one. So uh, this is just going to be two pi minus zero. So you end up with C1 being equal to the square root of one over two pi. Right, so that gives us our normalization constant. So our full uh, wave function here is going to be psi of phi. It's going to be equal to square root of one over two pi e to the i n phi. Right, so that's going to be our form of the wave function for the particle on a ring with our normalization constant and with our um, 
and with our form of the wave function here, right? So now this wave function is usually written in the following way. So we usually refer to that, uh, that quantum number, that integer that was involved there as M sub L, right? So this is the angular momentum quantum number. And so we have two pi e to the i m sub l phi. And m sub l could be equal to zero. It can be plus or minus one, plus or minus two, dot, 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 on and on, right? So any integer, basically. And so this leads to an energy expression where we have an energy expression that depends on this quantum number. And it'll have the following form, m sub l squared, h bar squared, over two I, where that I is the moment of inertia, right? So, um, so this will be the energy expression for the particle on the ring and the wave function for the particle on the ring. Now, something to note here, we talked about degeneracy before when we were talking about the particle in the box. Um, so for this energy expression, this energy expression is actually gonna be doubly degenerate. And the reason that this energy expression is gonna be doubly degenerate is because since this value, this quantum number is gonna be squared, if it's plus one or minus one, it doesn't matter. It's actually gonna give you the exact same energy. Even though you would get a unique wave function, you would have the same energy for plus and minus one, plus and minus two, plus minus three, on and on and on. So it's doubly degenerate for non-zero values for a non-zero m sub l. Obviously for zero, you have no double degeneracy there. It's just gonna be one number and one wave function and one energy value. Uh, but for everything else, it's going to be um, doubly degenerate. Now, uh, now the fact that, this, uh, z that you can actually have zero here produces an interesting result with, with respect to the zero point energy, right? Every other quantum problem we've looked at so far has a non-zero zero point energy right, uh, translational motion and vibrational motion. But here, our zero point energy for E sub zero actually is zero, right? So what does that say about rotational motion? Well, it tells us that uh, every quantum particle has to have some latent level of translational motion and some latent vibrational energy but it does not necessarily have to have any latent rotational energy, right? So quantum particles are always moving, they're always vibrating, they're not necessarily uh, rotating in a circular motion. And so the non-essential character of this uh, quantum mo motion is kind of spelled out in this zero point energy expression here. Okay, so that's the wave function for the particle on the ring and its energy level and its Hamiltonian. Um, so in the next video, we're going to start looking at angular momentum in a little bit more detail, uh, looking explicitly at the operator quantum mechanically for angular momentum.